me as a guest uh, speaker. I mean, when you walk into the room, you see uh, wonderful graphics like this with uh, breaking through the bull.com. You know you're in for a good lunch uh, uh, today. I'm uh, Todd Letts, and I'm uh, the President and CEO of the Great Kitchener Waterloo Chamber of Commerce, and uh, I'm uh, happy to welcome you. It's great to see so many folks uh, here today. Uh, our uh, speaker today is uh, Jim Clemmer, and uh, he'll be formally introduced by uh, Murray Costello, uh, who's a member of our board of directors. Uh, Murray is uh, with Uni Gas, a Spectre Energy Company, and Uni Gas is also one of our sponsors here today, as well as the Laurier School of Business and uh, Economics. Uh, and thank you to our sponsors for uh, making this possible uh, today. representing uh, Laurier School of Business, Rick Bigelow of uh, Union Gas, Karina <coughs> MJ of Union Gas, and uh, our guest speaker. So without uh, further ado, uh, Murray, I'd like to ask you to uh, introduce Jim. Thank you, Todd. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm here to introduce Bob. Oftentimes we enable 
problems or issues in a family, whether it's abuse or alcoholism or whatever the issue may be, and we enable problems in the workplace when we ignore them, when we don't deal with them. We allow them to continue on. So this is a particular issue, and what I want to push you to think a little bit about as you think about your own workplaces, and maybe even your own families or relationships, is I don't think that there's any middle ground here. We're either part of the problem or we're part of the solution. It's really because if we're not doing something about it, we become part of the problem. We're not trying to advance it in some way. So today, what I'm really drawing from is uh, doing a, a series. Oops, sorry, a series of uh, workshops across the country that are starting. Actually, the very first one here is in uh, two weeks' time, on April 3rd, in Cambridge. Uh, that one is actually sold out now, but we are putting on a second follow-up session to it, probably around the end of May. I think you have a, some of this in your brochure. So today, what I want to do is really kind of draw out of that. <laughs> What are some of the experiences? What are some of the signs of the moose? What are some of the uh, things that you can do to try to help deal with the, this whole moose issue? I'm going to jump up and down a bit here as I go back and forth with my slides. The, the whole notion, some of my earlier work, which I know a few of you we chatted with beforehand or been familiar with some of my previous books. This is actually the sixth one now. And uh, all of my other books have been more traditional textbook kinds of books. Uh, well, this one is a novel, as you might have guessed by the title of it, and maybe by the, uh, the whimsical nature of the book as well. Part of the reason that we did that, because we first started talking about moose on the table in the earlier books, and we have some moose hunting uh, activities and exercises. But part of what we've tried to do here is using the story of Pete Leonard, who's a, a middle manager, in a typical organization that's really struggling. We've tried to bring a little bit of fun, bring a little bit of safety, really, to this difficult issue. Because dealing with moose is tough. And we found with some of our clients, one client that we worked with for now four years is Barrett Gold. And we helped them design, based on the earlier book of Leaders Digest, they designed a health and safety program to uh, try to truly really change the culture of their organization, to get people talking more about health and safety issues, addressing those issues, even more directly confronting each other around how in many, many companies, but especially in the mining industry, there's something that in the health and safety world, if any of you in this world you've probably heard the term or used the term, normalization of deviance, which is where people develop workaround strategies, or people turn blind eyes, or people let unsafe practices happen and over time, it becomes normalized. It becomes just part of the way we do business. And I always remember years back, we were doing some work with a restaurant chain. The CEO of the chain was a very strong leader, a very effective leader. He said, if I'm walking into the restaurant from the parking lot, and I go buy a bunch of garbage in the parking lot, and I either don't pick it up or make sure it gets picked up, I've just said it's OK to have garbage in the parking lot. I've just normalized that as being OK. So that's the kind of position that Beric was coming from. And so they started playing with the idea. You see the little uh, Beric Moose here with uh, the hard hat on and the shirt. And uh, they, they played with it in various ways. They do moose hunting exercises as part of this two-day workshop. They have, uh, in their African mine operation, they have a uh, plywood cutout of a moose that uh, makes it around the office and shows up at meetings. Or if you come back from, uh, from lunch and it's in your office, <laughs> We got to talk. <laughs> wants to talk with you. There's a moose that we need to deal with here. In our Australian operation, they have these little things hanging around the off the, uh, the walls. And then I want these shoes grab moose. So it's like a little break the glass and have an emergency. So we've got a little moose hanging there. So these are some examples of some of the ways that we've played with this whole notion of what I think of as courageous conversations. And so what I want to do now is just quickly walk through with you what is kind of a chicken and egg discussion right now, which is both what causes a moose mess and as the result of a moose mess are a couple of typical scenarios and cultures that are set up within many teams and organizations. So here's where you might want to kind of check off a little bit and say, yeah, to what extent does this apply to our team, our organization, or to me? The first one is the ever popular, we need more communication around here. How many times have we heard that? Everybody says, we've got to communicate around here more. Now, how many people feel 
feel that in your organization you need more communication. It's popular in church. Sure. Most organizations say that. <laughs> now, how many feel then that that means sending each other more email? <laughs> now, I'm a lover of email, I'm a lover of rim. And uh, in fact, I was in this room speaking at a conference last summer, last spring, when Jim Balsilli was also here talking about not allowing the Blackberry to run our lives, not allowing email to run our lives, and using all of these things effectively as effective tools. Well, that's part of the problem here, is that we oftentimes get confused between informing and communicating. And we, we somebody says, we need more communication around here, what do we do? We send more emails. Well, that isn't necessarily communicating. It might be informing, and that can be useful, but it isn't necessarily communicating. So that's part of the problem. Another part of the problem is that we sometimes have a real failure to communicate. So here's our, uh, uh, our favorite little uh, mascot. This is uh, Cool Hand Moose. And uh, what is it that causes a failure to communicate? Well, part of that is that we maybe not don't have the skill or the right behaviors for communication. That may be part of why there's a failure to communicate. The other part that's often not seen nearly as much, and as we get deeper into doing ongoing work with some of our clients, we start to see that oftentimes communication issues are really process issues, the way we've structured the organization, how processes work in the organization. So it's a very complex issue, and there's no one easy, quick answer to it. But uh, shows up as we need to improve communication. So that might be causing moose, or the communication issue might be attracting moose. That's why, again, it's a chicken or an egg dilemma. Leadership lip service is looking at how we oftentimes will say things like walk the talk, lead by example. We all say and define, well, that's what leadership is. We all need to walk the talk and lead by example. And that's certainly true. Sometimes we don't recognize, though, when we're out of step. And there was that uh, father that went stomping into the principal's office one day, and very upset because the other kids were stealing the son's pencils. And he said to the principal, it's not the pencils that has me upset here, it's the principal of the thing. I can get plenty of pencils at work. It's <laughs> <laughs> the principal of the thing. So sometimes it's difficult to see the degree to which we are disconnected, or what we're saying and what we're doing are not connected together. Here's a continuum that we use a lot, in fact, going back to, to work at Barrick. They use this continuum quite extensively, and we help them build a model around, so what are the behaviors at all levels, from the board, right through the executives, to supervisors, to managers, to the front line, to the miners, what are the behaviors that are consistent with health and safety, in their case, that was a big drive. Because one of the things that we can do is we can give permission to, yes, we want more health and safety, yes, here's some money, here's some dollars, go make it happen. And that's a popular thing, especially for many executives to do. To say, yeah, we need a new IT system, we need new whatever, here it is, go bring it in. And so there'll be some degree of change, but it's a small degree of change. So we move up the continuum to lip service. Again, a little more change, now it's maybe a little more assertive, a little less passive. I'm talking about the importance of the change, why we need to change, why you need to change. If I ramp, ramp up the rhetoric even further to passionate lip service, I'm talking about how important it is that you get more customers focused. You need to focus more on health and safety. You need to work more as a team. What's wrong with this picture? It's all about me saying how I want to change you. All the changes you need to make. It's a lot more difficult to really look at it and say, what do I need to do differently as a leader? Because something I'm doing, or not doing, has gotten a, a behavior within my team and my group. So this isn't, as Don Cherry might say, rocket surgery when you really think about this. <laughs> so in order to change their behavior, I need to change whom? Myself, my own behavior. That's the tough part. Because it's so much harder to do that. It's so much easier to say, well, I want to change them. I want to change them. There's an old parenting adage that I'm reminded of from time to time, especially when I like other. Uh, the children act like their parents despite all attempts to teach some good manners. <laughs> you see your kids doing something, you think, where did you learn that? And then if you're really honest, you take a really deep look in the mirror. Because recognizing your own behavior coming back to you, I think is one of the most difficult things we can do as leaders and parents. 
So if I look in the mirror and I take them, I'm really honest, I can say, well, you clearly learned that behavior from your mother. <laughs> <laughs> because, of course, it's tough to see our own behavior coming back and to say, you know, maybe I'm throwing some answers here. Maybe I'm part of the loose problem. Maybe part of the reason that issues aren't being addressed the way they ought to is my behavior. That's tough to own up to that. It's tough to face that. And the other part of the courageous conversation, I think, is not only initiating difficult conversations about t taboo kind of topics and things that aren't being addressed, but is oftentimes to hear tough conversations that really reflect back on our own behavior and our own leadership and our skills. And so getting to the point of fully integrated and making it part of who we are is a key element here. So that's part of leadership lip service. The other part of leadership lip service is dealing with our boss. Now, here's a, a survey, and, and clearly this survey is a, a little bit biased because people who are going to badbossology.com are likely not real happy with the process. <laughs> so we can say this is probably a bit of a slanted survey and not completely typical. Of, uh, of every uh, every workplace, but I present it to put a little bit of a mirror up to you and to say, what would some of the people on your team be saying? How might they answer if they went to this? Maybe they are. How do you know? They are going to this website. Twenty-two percent would send their boss for management training. Well, that's not that unusual. As a matter of fact, a lot of times when we do workshops, what we often hear is, "Geez, I wish my boss were here. My boss." Were here. Sometimes what happens, of course, is they're so focused on what the boss needs that they're kind of missing the point themselves because they can't you know, change the boss, but they can't change themselves. Almost 30% would have their boss assessed by a workplace psychologist. <laughs> now, here's where I think we are getting into some fairly slanted kind of research, so it's probably not uh, totally representative of the average workplace. And here's the really interesting one almost 50% would fire their boss. So there's some, in this case anyway, there's some pretty strong feelings about dealing with the boss. One of the things as you get into reading Pete Leonard's story, I debated what do I do about his boss? Because one of the ways that I found again and again and again, and I actually get quite frustrated about it, I keep trying to push participants in my sessions who are in middle management or supervisory roles, who basically sit back and say, well, if only they would tell us. If only they would communicate. If only my boss would set better priorities. If only my, and basically disempower themselves by sitting back and saying, well, it's all about the boss being a better boss and manager. I could do my job, but it wasn't for them. Well, that isn't leadership. And so part of what I, I came up with in the story with Pete Leonard and his boss, Doug Gray, is I really made him into a dragon boss. By the way, many of the names in the book actually have a root um, meaning. So if you're into any of that, you can go back through and kind of figure out what some of the names mean. Drake actually has to do with dragon comes from the root word for dragon. So Doug Drake is a dragon. And part of the reason for making him a dragon is to say, well, if Pete Leonard can ultimately be an upward leader with that kind of boss, then there's even fewer excuses for many of the rest of us to not practice <coughs> upward leadership in dealing with our own bosses, whoever they may be. So we go on and we look at another common challenge that, again, creates moose and calls moose to the workplace, but is also perhaps a symptom of moose problems in the workplace, where people get frustrated, angry, bitter, cynical. The culture becomes sometimes very poisonous, although I may be an extreme. It may just be a, a culture of negativity, why things can't be done. Now, there's obviously a, a continuum here as to how extreme some of this gets. But what tends to happen in, a, in the more extreme, if we took a continuum and said, well, one end would be a very positive, can-do kind of culture, the other end would be an extremely negative, uh, can't-do kind of culture with a high degree of victimness. At that end of the spectrum, we would say, well, there are a lot of people that have not only taken occasional visits, but have moved into any city. Maybe you know some people like that. We spend a lot of time in Pity City. Well, Pity City is a, uh, fortunately, a fairly popular place. <laughs> and it's a deadly place. It's a toxic place. People who spend a lot of time, there's a lot of great research out on this now, especially in the field of cognitive psychology, that people who spend a lot of time in Pity City 
have anywhere from four to five times higher likelihood of heart attack strokes, eight times higher likelihood of, of depression than those who are at the, more at the other end of the extreme. So it's a popular place, it can be a deadly place, it's an unfortunately infected many workplaces. One of the key vehicles, one of the popular vehicles to getting there is the bitter bus. <laughs> You know some people that ride in a bus every day in Newark. You might even know a few drivers. <laughs> I was talking in Calgary with a group a while ago, it was a healthcare group, and I was talking about uh, this whole area of Pity City and taking the therapeutic visits once in a while, and how we don't want to live in Pity City. And someone in the group said, My husband is the mayor. <laughs> Tell the signs early on, one of 
project is likely to be doomed. In fact, one of the big things, this is what, what this brings to mind for me, is we oftentimes get managers saying, we need more accountability around here. And I always remember one particular organization where that was the big thing driving it, more accountability. How come people aren't taking accountability? Well, why aren't they sticking up and saying this stuff and so on? And as we got deeper into it, we could see that it was a very nuanced, complex kind of culture where essentially if you were to say, hey, I don't think this project's deadlines are realistic, or I don't think if you were to raise that kind of issue at the table, you'd be deemed a non-team player, and you'd be sanctioned in all kinds of ways and shut down, and told basically, how come you're not on board? What's the matter with you? Well, that's a classic moose problem in the making. And that organization was full of moose. That was really the roots of the accountability problem. People weren't stepping up to issues because people couldn't honestly say what they really believed. And so they left the, the meeting feeling like, okay, well, I can't really say, tell the boss what he really wants to hear, so I'll go and try to do my best. And uh, of course, they leave knowing right from the beginning there's never going to work, but they can't have that conversation because it's not an open enough workplace to do that. 77% compare their failing projects to slow motion train wrecks. Again, you see early on, watch it happen. 81% said approaching a key decision maker about the project is nearly impossible. One of the things we use in our uh, workshop, which is always a very popular little video, and some of you may have read the book years ago or saw the earlier version, they've updated the video, it's called The Abilene Paradox. And it's a story of how a family ends up taking a trip to a cafe in Abilene when nobody wanted to go. And uh, they end up coming back afterwards, they drove four hours, it was hot, it was a terrible experience. They come back and they start saying, well, you wanted to go, well, that's why I went. No, I didn't want to go, and nobody wanted to go. And then the story goes on to talk about a research project in an organization called Project X, and how everybody believes it's doomed, but nobody's talking about it. Everybody thinks everybody else is supporting it, but nobody is supporting it. And it almost drags the company under. There are unfortunately way too many examples of, of companies that are pulled under by this stuff, or there has now been a lot of research to show that the two big spectacular NASA explosions in the space shuttle were exactly this problem. The engineers knew there was a problem, but the minute they tried moving it up through the culture, it got shut down. Oh, we got deadlines here, can't miss those deadlines, got to get this project off, we got, and the whole conversation was closed down. People died as a result. Unfortunately, that's what happens, whether it's at Barrett Gold or many other places. Oftentimes, people literally die for one, of naming the moose and dealing with the moose and having a true, real conversations. So, our last one then is, uh, whoops, our last one is looking at, okay, we're going back here. Sorry, I'm going to get back to the uh, right slide on. The right slide number, there we are. Disengagement and demoralization, another growing problem across the uh, country, actually. Uh, here's some of the research that uh, is showing just what a problem it's becoming. This was uh, done by one of the HR consulting groups, Towers Parent. Uh, there are a number of groups around to do this kind of research, and uh, we're working with one line right now that uh, is very much involved in how to get people engaged. 17%, now this was a couple years ago, they saw a slip in number of Canadians generally in the workplace who are engaged. And so uh, their definition of engagement I think is a pretty good one, willing to invest discretionary effort. Here's the middle part of the bell curve. Some 66% Some 66% are, uh, are moderately engaged. And that's where I think the real opportunity is. This is the group that if we can reach them, as leaders. If we can get them more engaged, we can have a dramatic impact on the organization. 17% are actively disengaged. Now, I was just in Alberta last week doing a series of workshops, and of course there, they have a major issue with retention. And I know some of you, especially in technology businesses and various places here, have issues too. It's huge out there. And one of the things you start looking at, well, if retention is an issue, hanging on to good people is an issue, then there's some real answers here. Because the research shows people in this group have an 88% likelihood of leaving within the next six months. So clearly, there's some retention opportunities there. But what about this group, 66%? They could go either way. That's two thirds of the organization. So they're going to get pulled towards the disengaged side or pulled towards the engaged side.
stuff. What is it that engages them? Well, many of the things that we've talked about, openness, leadership, a lot of the issues that we've covered here. So where the, the book came from then is, I guess maybe 10 years ago or so, I came across the work of Joseph Campbell. And uh, he wrote a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which is actually from 1949, it's a classic, where he studied mythology around the world and throughout time and identified that there are common themes to the human story, common themes to the stories of the heroes, whether they're told around campfires, whether they're told on the movie screens, uh, whether they're just told one-on-one, -on -one. there are these common themes that keep showing up. And he believed that myths or stories, the stories we tell each other, the stories we listen to, the stories in our society, are really the energies of the cosmos bringing human culture, culture in the manifestation. So he presented some very strong evidence to show that when you look at history, at religions, philosophies, arts, all different sorts of forms of storytelling, you keep seeing these same paths, these same journey show up. So I was debating writing a fable, which I'd never done before, and, uh, uh, and the whole moose on the table thing was one that I know connected with people because I have an office full of moose paraphernalia. Every moose item you can ever imagine from clients uh, somewhere along the way, so I knew it was connected. It was open up conversations. And then I happened to hear of a uh, writer's workshop that um, featured the work of Chris Vogel. Now, Chris wrote a book as well, which I had not heard of until I saw this promotion for this. I got the book and I devoured it since. It's an outstanding book based on Campbell's work. He, he is a um, an independent consultant now, but at the time he worked for a couple of major Hollywood studios vetting screenplays, looking at screenplays, deciding which ones might get made in the movies. And he, uh, in his lifetime, he believes that he's reviewed 10,000 screenplays. So he's worked for a lot of screenplays. And he also began to see the same theme showing up. And he knew that Campbell had also been a uh, consultant to George Lucas on the Star Wars series. Because George Lucas very deliberately uh, watched some old DVD a while ago or around this time, uh, Bill Moyer interviewing uh, Joseph Campbell at Skywalker Ranch. And uh, George Lucas as well, talking about how the storytelling myth of the hero of the thousand faces was very much the pathway that uh, Luke Skywalker and, and the uh, characters were using. So here's Chris's point on this. He says, all stories have a few common structural elements found universally in myths, fairy tales, dreams, movies, etc. No one has the hero's journey. And then he goes on to say, and this is what I think is really relevant for all of us in this room. The hero's journey is nothing less than a handbook for life, a complete instruction manual in the art of being human. So I find it really fascinating to sit back and say, okay, in my own life then, what are the different hero's journeys that I'm involved in? Because they're layered on top of each other. There's maybe our overall lifelong quest, whether it's a personal goal, spiritual quest, whatever it might be. Then there's maybe particular projects or initiatives or major changes or transitions in our lives or our workplaces that might be our own little hero's journey. Then maybe it's a, a major disaster, catastrophe, trauma in our life, which is what in, in Chris and uh, Joseph's uh, parlance is the call, where the call goes out to us. So the hero always gets the call. And the hero is usually reluctant. The hero usually says, not me, this isn't the right time, uh, I don't I, I don't want to get involved at this point. But whenever, there's usually, and in many of the stories in Hollywood especially, there's usually some kind of disaster or trauma that pulls the hero into the story. And then early on, a mentor character starts showing up and on through a series of, of stories. So what you'll see when you uh, get into, and I, and I know you're going to be up till 3 o'clock this morning to read it, so. <laughs> but when you get into the story, you see that it's really in three major sections, and then the first section is really about the call to action. So here's Pete. All of these problems that I've described earlier are showing up in his workplace, and he's just trying to go along to get He's just trying to say, no, I don't, don't need to deal with all of this. I just want to kind of do my job. I've got an idiot for a boss, a horrible boss. We've got all these problems in our organization. I'd rather not deal with them. I don't feel I can, etc." So he, like many other people, ended up spending time sitting in rocky 
Coffee and Bowl of Lincoln's Bar, which is in Chapter 3, is part of the uh, Dread Society, the Dread Poets Society. Uh, and Poets Society, I'm sorry, they just call themselves the Poets Society. We call it the Dread Poets Society. But the Poets Society is the, well, the polite version of it is pee on everything until sunrise. It's called. <laughs> they get around and they, uh, they sit around and they kind of fight about how he should do this or they should do that and so forth. They don't really want to step up to the issues. So then they eventually do, and Pete's adventure continues. A very interesting uh, character shows up that um, is a mentor, but we're not sure uh, whether he really exists or not. So Pete goes through the struggle. Now in a few minutes I'm going to talk about when we get into, so how do we deal with all of this? I'm going to talk about what are some of the key elements of dealing with the moose issue. And that's what is, you'll see then illustrated in the book. Some of them explicitly illustrated, many of them more implicit in the story as it unfolds, as Pete is now trying to step up and deal with the moose. And he has setbacks, and he does some of the classic thing that managers sometimes do is where they step up and they try to deal with the moose, and they do it in a very poor way, and they actually make the situation worse. And so they need to regroup and try to end. And then lastly, we see him achieving some breakthrough and really making uh, quite a difference and moving to a new level which in the hero's journey is what Joseph Campbell calls the return with the elixir. So the hero in most stories often returns with some kind of answer, or insight, or some sort of solution, or approach, or process that then helps them uh, and their team or their friends or whomever they be move on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to show how in this one day session that we designed and I'm drawing this material from, not so much to talk about the session as to talk about the key elements, because that's where the, the answers, I think, are to how we deal with this stuff. Well, first is I think we need to have an, an honest assessment of what is our culture like. Ideally, if we can even get some kind of survey, maybe do some of those sorts of surveys, or third-party assessment, or some kind of, of unvarnished input that says this is the kind of culture we have in our because, of course, one of the problems with the moose thing is that managers where there are big moose problems are usually the ones that turn around and say, well, we don't have a moose problem here because nobody's telling me there's a problem. Of course, the irony is nobody's telling you because there is a moose problem. That's why they're not telling you. Because they know when they try to tell you, you either don't listen, or you shut them down, or you might even shoot the messenger. And so they're not telling us. So having some good culture assessment, really looking at, do we have a moose mess? Are we doing a lot of playing of the blame game? And then we get into the whole issue around navigating change. Now navigating change, there's a very simple model here that uh, we found quite useful over the years, which is to say, well, as we're dealing with change in our lives or our workplaces, there's three possible responses. We can be a survivor sitting in the middle, hoping that things get better. And sometimes that's wise. Ideally, we live up the line and a hopeful skeptic, not the the line and a helpless cynic. Ideally, we're up in this territory. One of the things in the story that you'll see is that Pete is confronted with this early on. And the whole idea, which is what I found, and I always use this model with many management groups, this is leadership territory up here. What is it that leaders do? Most first and foremost, there's so many things they do. It's in so many ways, but I think one of the core elements of leadership is making people hopeful, making people see what could be, bringing a sense of possibility, especially to really difficult situations. So, this is leadership territory. Down here is human territory, down here in Pity City, but this is a territory we want to spend little time there as we can, and certainly with our team. We want to spend a lot of time down here. We may need some therapeutic visits once in a while to uh, blow off some steam, to vent some frustration. And that's to be human. But we want to spend most of our time up on the line. So I think that's part of what we need to look at and say, well, what are, where do I spend most of my time? And where is my team spending much of its time? And how can we, how can both me and my team, recognize maybe earlier the signs that we're slipping below? and then help each other get back up above the line, spend more time up there rather than down below. So moving on then to, uh, so I'm going to jump back here. So what are some of the other elements? Well, so 
some of the other elements then are looking around and seeing, are there some loose tracks, such as conversations happening after in the hallway, such as um, commitments not being kept, deadlines continually being missed, the accountability issue, is that frustrating the heck out of lots of people? Uh, do we find in our, in our meetings that people are just frustrated with meetings generally? Oh, geez, not about the meetings. I think a lot more work done than there wasn't for all these bloody meetings, constantly getting in the way. Well, that's usually a sign of those problems. It may not always be, but often it is. Um, or are we finding that uh, our meetings aren't really open discussions and debates, that people either tend to agree or just stay quiet? We don't have real good, strong, uh, critical conversations and debates. So do we have loose tracks? Do we have a good balance of management and leadership? Oops. We, um, looking at the triangle, the connecting together of what we do, how we do it, and who we are, and the skills and the behaviors that we bring. Do we have a good balance of those three? And it's classic that in many organizations, well, there's usually one of two stories that unfolds here. One story is in startup entrepreneurial organizations, they offer lots of energy and lots of leadership and customer focus and so forth, but they may not have good rigor and discipline around systems and processes, because you can paper over lots of problems with money. That's a classic startup issue. Or, more often, the reverse side is more established organizations who their processes and their systems and their technologies are driving their people, their customers and their um, frontline people. They're essentially saying, we will dictate to you the terms upon which you will have the pleasure of doing business with us. You're going to do it this way. You're going to deal with us in, in this manner. And so it's connecting the hands, the head, and the heart is the real balance issue here. So again, looking at how are we doing it then? How are we taking a good balanced approach in our work? And especially between these two. These tend to be the two sides of the equation that often are over focused on one side or the other. This side is more EQ, this side is more, or sorry, IQ, more EQ. Well, continuing on then with what are some of the other elements? And uh, I hope you can find this to be a little bit like a checklist to say, okay, are there some components here that we could use? Are we using courageous leadership? Am I part of the solution? Am I having those difficult conversations? <laughs> or am I part of the problem? And you see again in the early chapters, Pete really is part of the problem. He's really avoiding it. He's really not wanting to have those difficult conversations. And uh, it's so easy, of course, to sit back and not have those tough conversations. Well then, are we balancing management leadership, or what are we doing to build trust and teamwork? Do we really know what is tearing down some of the trust? Again, if we, if we have loose issues, issues, we don't really maybe have a good sense of the emotional or trust bank accounts within the team, within the organization. So have we got some kind of feedback or inventory or some way of monitor, monitoring some of that? Yeah, no time. Are you trying to tell me the time is getting time? Any time. Yeah, okay. Make sure we have time. Sure. Okay. Well, let me uh, let me wrap up with what are some of the other key elements. Then I said earlier the whole idea of using Moose. I hope if you read the book or uh, get into some of this, you might even just use the Moose metaphor. You don't have to buy all the stuff Moose like you did. But you might say something like. Is there a moose on the table here we need to talk about? Well, or am I smelling a moose? Or you might just play with that metaphor a little bit as a way of trying to do a little bit more moose hunting. Looking at uh, what are some of the, the major pathways, which we've kind of touched on a little bit to, uh, to dealing with change. And to what extent you're finding the balance around the use of email as a wonderful tool, as an outstanding tool, a very helpful tool, but we have to be careful that the tool isn't driving us and that we aren't allowing the email beast to keep sucking more and more time away from leadership, away from conversations. Because a lot of times, moose really feed 
on dysfunctional email usage. They love flaming email. They love email that goes back and forth where people are dancing around avoiding issues, or the kind of cowardly emails where you fire out somebody something that you couldn't say to their face. To they love all that stuff. And so are we allowing some of that to really taint our culture? and as a result, not have us having difficult conversations. Are we avoiding upward leadership? There's a lot of talk these days about leading our teams, about even leading ourselves, perhaps leading our peers. I think an area that needs every bit as much focus is leading upward. It's in this area where it's so easy to be a victim and to say, well, it's my boss. If only they would. If only I got the information, the classic communication that nobody tells me anything around here. Well, that to be a victim, to be a leader, to be a navigator is to say, I'm going to go find out. I'm going to go get the information I need. I'm going to pass along whatever I've got. I'm going to try to be a leader here, not sit back and be a victim of perhaps poor or bad boss. The issue, how do you motivate people? One of the key things that we often hear is uh, we've got to figure out how to improve morale. I saw a, a uh, Cartoon, Farkas cartoon a few years ago where a manager was standing in front of the group saying, we need to improve morale. Any of you boneheads have a good idea. <laughs> and so wonderfully wrapped up the issue of if, if in your place you're thinking we need to motivate, we need to get people more inspired, energized, too often the management side of the equation, back to that management leadership balance, the management side of the equation is looking for ways to push. The leadership side of the equation says what's getting in the way? What's holding people back? What, are the, what can we do to remove some of those barriers or obstacles? That's true leadership that will unleash them with potential. And what is our culture? At the very core of culture are our core values. Now, many organizations these days have done some work with core values. Uh, usually about 70 80 percent of most medium or large size organizations have some set of core values. But most of them have a high snicker factor. They're sitting on a wall somewhere, or if you put in an organization and say, do you, do you have a set of core values? Maybe somebody will rustle through a desk and pull out an old file folder, pull off the dust, and then somebody else will say, well, that's not the right version. No, there's another. And there's a whole bunch of confusion about what is our core values? Do we have core values? There's a long list of core values. Worst I ever saw was one organization that gave out a little booklet to everybody, and it was at the front of it said, our core values, and inside, handily numbered from 1 to 36. <laughs> where their core values. So there's a lot of disastrous stuff done around core values, which really raises the snicker factor. Core values need to be three, four, or five at the most, and mostly they need to be alive, because they are at the core of the culture. So how do we make them alive? Well, the key ways we make them alive is in our hiring, firing, and promotion decisions. Those are the key ways we make them alive, and then how do you manage training and the other elements? All right, so you want to make sure there's time for some Q&A and uh, to wrap things up. So uh, let me um, pause here then. And uh, as we're wrapping up, you will find on your tables that there are uh, there's an opportunity if you'd like to join our monthly email list, which is a free list. You're welcome to do that. We will have available some of the other uh, books of mine as well at our table over here on the way out. Um, Aiden's going to hustle over there and be available for any of that. So in terms of wrapping up, any questions, comments? On a fair bit of territory here, kind of giving you a real rush course in moose hunting. So uh, any, any questions, first of all, who you'd like me to talk to?
I'm not going to be part of the problem. I'm going to do something to try to make moves, to try to reduce Delta. Or I'm going to do something to create a, a safe environment that allows people to identify these issues so that we can collectively do some of these things. That is a good question. There's a good question. Is the presentation available online? Actually, Aiden, who's our marketing director, has been at the back uh, recording this, and he'll have it on YouTube within a couple of days. Google video probably tomorrow. So I'm going to upload it first thing tomorrow morning. So the whole thing is up there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so if you want to have other people look at it and use it as a way of opening up conversation, which is, there are already on our website, <coughs> funny.net, a couple of dozen video clips where I go into much greater depth in all of these things. So that's all freely available already at our main website. So you can go there. And what some people have done is they've used it, as it sounds like maybe you might want to do, to get other team members looking at it and then opening up some of those conversations. Sure. In terms of the moves within smaller groups and larger organizations, is there a different way to approach it based on the organization size? Oh, boy. Now, I think more of the, the way it is approached is based on the culture of the organization and especially the immediate leaders of the organization and how open they are. And that's often the dilemma, as you see, I wrote about with Pete Leonard, you get these bosses sometimes that are completely closed to any of this. And that makes it especially challenging. So I don't find that there's a correlation around the size of the organization. I've seen small organizations with horrendous moose problems. And I've seen large organizations that don't really have a lot of those problems. So it's more around the, the culture and the leadership style of the key leaders of the organization, how open and transparent the organization is. <coughs> yeah, good questions. Any other questions, comments? Let me ask you, what is this, what do you take away from this short little presentation? Some key reminders or maybe a point or two that stuck with you? Respond to that. So if you have something you want to bring in and introduce. 
there's some way to the entire Windows Digest book is written around that, that concept. I think, uh, Jim, you mentioned about uh, you know, part of the subset of the leadership is uh, you know, when there is a change happening in the, the company, you know, how do you do it? And, uh, and I think great leadership always does. How do I take advantage of this change? Right. And, uh, and that, that simple approach and uh, being optimistic about it and uh, you're pretty familiar on this. Absolutely right. His comment was that how the leader views change and trying to figure out how can we take advantage of it with the old lemons and the lemonade approach is makes a dramatic impact on how people feel about it. The research on emotional intelligence is very clear about that. That when a leader talks about or introduces a new change to a team, they take their cue from the leader as to how to feel about it. And whether the leader is implicitly or explicitly communicating how they feel, if they feel negative, the team will pick that up fairly quickly. So we really have to pay attention to our own cues. All right, yes? Jim, I have a question for you. Okay. All right. What's your best advice for a news center to survive and thrive? Mm. That is a tough one. I, I do take that seriously because I know that in many cultures, uh, dealing with a moose can be a CLM, mm. a career limiting moose. And, <laughs> and uh, it's hard again to give you the absolute general advice there, but sometimes it's well, actually, what, here's, uh, I didn't have time to get into this slide, so let me, I think this one kind of might be a way we can wrap this up. If we are in that kind of situation, I think that uh, we have three basic choices. Probably many of us in this room, I know I have in this room, at one time or another, follow all three of these. One is to live with it. So it's kind of balancing out and saying, okay, if I've got an ineffective boss, or if there's a loose problem in the organization, and I'm trying to be a moose hunter, and I'm not really succeeding at it, well, how big of a problem is it? Can I live with it or not? And there's times we might say it's an irritation, but it's not a, a critical thing. Another, another difficult one for us is to be a navigator, to say, you know, maybe it's time for me to go somewhere else, either within the company to try to find another boss, or leave, maybe be my own boss, or find a new company to work for. And sometimes that is to be a navigator. We've tried everything, we've done as much as we can, and we, and we just feel like there's nothing more we can do. The whole thing about upward leadership, probably the most popular column that I wrote for the Golden Mill Career section was on upward leadership. And if you go to our website and type upward leadership into our search engine, you'll come across a couple of articles there. You get in a series of things that we can do, and you see some of this demonstrated throughout the book. Um, ways that we can try to influence upward and be a moose hunter in a culture where that may not be welcome. So maybe on that note, I'll, uh, I'll wrap things up and uh, I'll leave you with my favorite little expressions or sayings. It's sort of become one of my, my favorite quotes. It came from Albert Hubbard about 100 years ago. Uh, he was an American writer, publisher. And I think because I was raised on a dairy farm, not very far away from here, about 25 miles northwest of Lake. I think because I was raised on a dairy farm, I especially love this comment of his, but it's all about leadership. Because leadership is an action, not a position, in my belief. So Hubbard said, people who want milk should not seat themselves on a stool in the middle of the field and wait for a cow to back up to them. <laughs> That's really good dairy farming advice. <laughs> but I think it's also at the very heart of the moose issue. We're either part of the problem or the part of the solution. We need to make it happen. And, uh, and well, if it is to be, it's up to me. We don't make it happen. So uh, happy moose hunting and happy milking. <laughs>
very, very much uh, appreciated. Uh, thank you so much for being here today and sharing uh, these great ideas with us.